Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome planetary astrophysicist Dr. Stephen Keane to the show. We're going to talk about the role private spaceflight plays in society and in developing science. We're also going to learn about the first discovery of a moon in another solar system. Next, we're going to head out to Mars, where the InSight rover has mapped the inner structure of the red planet in detail for the first time. Finally, we take a glimpse at a next-generation telescope that could potentially revolutionize astronomy before welcoming our special guest. Now, one of the great goals of modern astronomy has now been accomplished by astronomers from the European Southern Observatory using the ALMA network of 66 radio telescopes. The PDS-70 star system contains at least two planets denoted PDS-70b and c. An examination of PDF-70C revealed a ring of dust and debris around the nascent planet. Analysis showed this ring is likely forming a moon around this massive exoplanet about 400 light years from Earth. This is the first moon yet discovered in another solar system. Researchers using the InSight lander on Mars have analyzed the structure of the red planet in detail for the first time. By examining seismic waves caused by Mars quakes, investigators found the structure of the red planet consists of three layers, a crust, a mantle, and a molten core. The crust of Mars was found to comprise of two or three layers totaling between 12 and 37 kilometers thick. Beneath this lies a mantle and a large molten core, the study concluded. The Superfit telescope aims to become a low-cost alternative to the Hubble Space Telescope by flying high off the ground in a balloon. This half meter telescope will soar 40 kilometers or 25 miles above the surface of the ground, uh, above 99.5% of the atmosphere of Earth. Collecting data at night and charging its batteries by day Superbit is expected to go into full operation in April of 2022. The low cost of this system could allow astronomers worldwide access to Hubble-class telescopes for the first time. Sign me up. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we're going to welcome Dr. Stephen Kane to the show, discussing the role private spaceflight plays in society as well as in the growth of science. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Stephen Kane. He is a planetary astrophysicist at the University of California, Riverside, 
and he's here to talk to us about private space flight and what the flights of Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos could mean to the future of the human race. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Thank you very much, James. Happy to be here. Yeah. So tell us, first of all, what is it that they're hoping to accomplish? What, what, what are these flights of Bezos and Branson hope to do? Uh, yeah, the, it, it seems that, well, well there's, there's many different opinions about this, of course, about what the whole point of this exercise is. Um, uh, obviously, they're trying to advance their particular space programs. Uh, there's uh, uh, probably a lot of uh, ego involved in this as, as, as well. Uh, and many people have spoken about that, uh, about the egos of, of this. But um, uh, I, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of benefits to this. There's also a lot of things that we need to be very cautious about in this whole enterprise. Um, and, by, and by enterprise, I mean the private space enterprise. Uh, and so there's a, there's a lot of pros and cons, um, but uh, but in terms of what they're trying to achieve, I think they're just trying to uh, use this as a technology demonstration for, for their particular programs. Hmm. And so, you know, there's been, you know, a bit of a backlash online against, you know, the couple of flights, but as you pointed out in your recent interview at UCR, if um, if Branson, let's say, had not spent money developing Virgin Galactic, he may have spent it to buy a tropical island. And that would not have had any sort of backlash. So why is it that people get upset about space travel where they wouldn't be upset about, say, buying a tropical island or spending the money on stock buybacks? Uh, yeah, and, and, I, and I should qualify my statement there because I, I, I think that if they wasted money or, or perception of wasting money in any regard, there would always be a certain level of backlash. But there is something about space that seems to trigger this in particular. And so there's there's two pieces to this. One is um, why should we be doing, uh, doing space research of any kind, uh, regardless of how it's paid for? And secondly, should rich people or private enterprise be be leading the way on this and in terms of that first part about should we be doing space i mean this is uh th this comes up all the time not just for the most recent flights uh but for for nasa um and uh, the question uh, often comes up uh we we see this with uh missions that were showing the public all the time this is how your taxpayers dollars have been spent and many people uh, enjoy for example uh the missions to mars and the outer solar system and the recent announcements that i'm involved in on the missions to venus mm -hmm. uh and uh th there's a lot of positive feedback to that you also see the negative feedback which is what a waste of money why are we spending money on these kinds of things when there's problems right here on earth um and i know that many of my colleagues are uh, somewhat perturbed by these questions because they are difficult to answer, but they must be answered because uh, these are taxpayers' dollars that are being spent. We have an obligation to the public to make sure that they understand why we are doing this. Why are we going to space? And um, oftentimes we rely on spin-off arguments. For example, there is a, there is a, there's a whole list of uh, technological advancements from the space program over the decades, which has benefited other industries and, for, and for example, imaging within uh, medical use and things like that. And so the spin-off arguments is what is often pointed to. But I'll tell you this, James, I don't know any of my colleagues that became an astronomer or planetary scientist in the hope that their research might accidentally benefit medicine. Uh, if they really felt that way, they, they would have gone into medical research, right? <laughs> and, and so that's not why we're doing it. So we, we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't certainly shouldn't be relying on the spin-off arguments because that's disingenuous uh, because it's not telling people why we are doing it. And the reason that we're doing it is because we are 
uh, innately curious about the universe. We want to explore the universe. We want to know more about it. It's part of our human uh, nature, part of our human culture. And the suggestion that, for example, if we were to uh, remove the NASA budget, which is currently less than half a percent of the, of the total federal budget, uh, as opposed to what it was um, during the Kennedy area where it was almost 5%, uh, then the feeling is that if we were to remove all of that money and put it, it would immediately go into fixing the pothole at the end of the road, you know, or something like that. But of course it wouldn't. It, it would be disappearing into accountancy errors for the for the Defense Department. It would be renovating the bathrooms in Congress. It would be, you know, it would, it would disappear and in a way that would not be seen by the public and we would have lost something so dramatic because the loss of space research it's equivalent to asking why do we have music why do we invest money in the arts at all if we lost all the museums in the united states would anybody care and of course the answer is yes um no the money invested into those arts does not bring you the next version of the iphone right it, it doesn't do anything it, it doesn't repay your car but it brings an inspirational uh, guidance to us and our children to be better and to try and progress the human race further. And I think that is extremely important uh, is on top of the spin-off arguments that's made. That's why, that's why we do this. Hmm. But of course, you know, I, I, the spin-offs of, you know, space research in addition to that, still you know gave us new ways to protect our food new ways to um stop fires quickly in skyscrapers you know develop communications you know and so i guess my question is in addition to the spin-off arguments what's you know are we getting that sort of effect that you talk about you know from even NASA or, you know, or these, um, I, I guess I'm trying to, you know, ask, you know, is this effective? Yes. Uh, and, and one, I, I would uh, put it in even larger terms in, in terms of the, the spin-off benefit really is to understanding our planet, uh, particularly for, uh, myself as a planetary scientist and an exoplanet person and my colleagues who, who are all studying uh, the, uh, the effects of various properties of planets on their climates, both here in our solar system and elsewhere. This is all about learning uh, about, not just about other planets, because we're interested in finding uh, the possibility of habitable environments on other planets, but our baseline still is the Earth. The habitability of the earth and understanding intrinsically what makes the earth habitable that is extremely important because of course we all know that we're at a crucial time uh not just in human history but in planetary history because we're seeing a divergence uh of our planetary climate uh which is is caused by human activities and so we need to understand that going forward and so uh in terms of the broader context and what would benefit everybody that to me has to be the ultimate spin-off right <laughs> in terms of all of this work uh, making a sustainable environment for all of us going forward but of course there are many other things that that you mentioned about the technological advancements that do benefit people and i think largely that's uh that's transparent uh, to to a, a lot of folks, uh, and and that's a shame. There is one other thing uh, that I uh, that that is a huge concern about space industry uh, or private space industry leading the way in terms of space research, which is that uh, in, in many ways the laws or the regulations surrounding how we conduct such activities. Um, have not been set. Uh, there are international guidelines and laws that attempt to do this, but it's difficult to know if they're actually enforced. And in many cases, there are enormous gaps in those regulations that a private enterprise could easily exploit. And so the big concern here is that uh, if, if it's not, if that is 
not been led in terms of regulations by an international agreement, then private enterprise will lead that. And that means that they will set the regulations as they progress forward. Uh, and obviously the way in which they set those regulations will be designed in such a way to specifically benefit their, their progress as a company. That is enormously concerning. We should not be allowing that to happen. The, the, the use of space uh, in general should be something that happens by international agreement because space belongs to everybody, right? Wherever you are on the earth, you can look up and see the night sky. And to me, that's something that's almost sacred. Uh, and so when we talk about something like um, uh, Elon Musk's Starlink program, which, uh, as I'm sure you know, is launching all these satellites into space, which are visible from, from the Earth, and there are many more satellites that are planned to be launched, that, th that uh, affects all of us uh, on, on the ground. And that is something that should be heavily regulated, but at the moment does not seem to be. Uh, attempts to try and rein in those kinds of efforts have failed in the courts. Uh, and and uh, I would say that's probably my number one concern about this whole thing, that, that we're allowing uh, the motivations of private enterprise set the guidelines as opposed to international agreements. And do you think that the uh, backlash that we're seeing against um, these private space flights harms public support for science and NASA? It, it, it can do. And, and this is a big concern for me because, as I said, there's two parts of this about should we be studying space and space research uh, and, and should private enterprise be doing it? And it's the private enterprise uh, part that I, I believe could be harmful down the road for all kinds of space research, if not handled properly. And that's what we're seeing here, because I think that um, the recent flights of Branson and Bezos, uh, the way in which they went about it, it seems like they honestly thought that they would be hailed as heroes, you know, like first aviators. And so um, uh, that hasn't really turned out that way. <laughs> and, and the question is, why not? And, and part of the biggest uh, argument I hear against it is that there's uh, been a lot of publicity, especially over recent years, as we've seen the, uh, the wage and the wealth uh, gap increase, especially during the pandemic. It's been extraordinary. Uh, there's a, a great deal more focus on uh, the, the tax benefits that the rich are gaining relative to the middle class and the poor. And so there's a lot of anger and resentment right now uh, about people who are extremely wealthy in that top 1% who are not paying enough taxes. And so that's um, uh, what I'm hearing. And so some of the comments are, well, they should pay their taxes, but that's actually the problem. They are paying their taxes. The, the trouble is, is that the tax code needs to be completely reformed. And so I agree with people when they say, you know, these people should pay more taxes. Absolutely. There needs to be a reform in, in, in the taxes. But I'm, I must admit, I'm a little skeptical about if that's going to happen anytime soon. I don't see a lot of political will to make those changes. And Jeff Bezos is so wealthy at this point that he could he could buy the IRS and turn it into a public company, and that'd be the end of that. You know, of course, that's being facetious. But the point is, is that um, is that the I don't think that we can count on that changing anytime soon, unfortunately, as much as it should. And so the question for me is, if if we just assume that the tax rules are not going to change and that the, the, the wealthy are going to continue to pay way less taxes than they should. What should they be doing with their with, with, with their money? Should they be investing in an, anthropic activities um, um, or should they be investing more in charities um, or, or should they be buying the tropical island you mentioned earlier? I mean, what should they be doing with their money? It's up to them. They're private citizens. They can do whatever they want. Uh, and uh, if they're going to invest in space research, then I'm really happy about that. Um, uh, like I said, just to, just to really drive home this point, ideally, I would love for them to pay way more taxes. But I think e even if they did that, 
it, they would still do this. They have uh, a, many decades, especially Branson has been invested in this activity for decades. And it's not like if he paid more taxes, he would just suddenly throw the whole thing out. He would still continue to do it. So it's not a, it, it's not an issue of their efforts in space are coming at the expense of them paying uh, more taxes. Uh, in the ideal world, it would be both. They would pay more taxes and do this. But I think that's the primary thing which is driving what you mentioned, which is the, the public backlash. And I am concerned about that because if people do, if it amplifies this feeling that we we're talking about earlier, that the rich people are doing it, they're not paying enough taxes, therefore it is a waste of money, then that can leak over into things like NASA where which is based on taxpayer dollars. And so if it starts to compromise that even further, like I said, uh, NASA's total budget is less than half a percent of the federal budget. So if that were to shrink further, it would dramatically uh, impede our progress, uh, would start to lose our position as a world leader uh, in, in space research. And that would be an incredibly uh, bad thing, not just in terms of, you know, chest thumping nationalism of being a world leader, but in terms of what it promotes in, in terms of young people getting into STEM and the, uh, and the inspiration that people get from seeing what we're able to accomplish as humans. And of course you mentioned the, you know, we talked about the, the last time we really I want to say it that way, but during the 1960s, when we were first launching people into space, you know, you had, you know, Alan Shepard going to the edge of space and coming right back down. Um, but the investment in science in the early 60s, including the NSF building, you know, large numbers of observatories around the country, including Kit Peep, right near me, you know, created a generation of people who really loved science, uh, including my dad who helped build power supplies for Apollo uh, and the space shuttle. Um, so my question is, how does this, pri you know, these private flights compare to the early flights of, um, of NASA and the Russians in public perception? Well, um, it, it goes back, I, I think, to this, uh, uh, this difference of we did that versus they did that. Uh, and what I mean by that is when we consider the flights that you mentioned, and, and particularly uh, one might consider the, 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 the epitome of these kinds of events, which was, of course, the Apollo 11 landing on the moon, you know, when the whole world watched and, and everybody, e e even people who weren't Americans, were just awestruck by this because it really seemed a humanity uniting moment. The, the big difference here is when it's private enterprise doing this, that, that um, uh, immediately, uh, uh, creates this distance between people's uh, feelings of unity and this is an individual doing that. But also, as I mentioned, the disparity uh, in, in the wealth gap, uh, I, I think it cre is created a lot of investment as well. So uh, I, I think there's, there's a, a lot of differences between the culture that was uh, back then and the, the culture that exists now uh, and, and, and just this huge, huge uh, wealth gap. And how do you think that that could affect um, the Artemis programs and our return to our return to the moon? Well, I, I, I think we need to put the focus back on uh, collaborative efforts uh, because, uh, like like I said, we, when it comes to uh, things like Blue Origins um, uh, going into space then that's just seen as, okay, they're trying to create some space tourism industry. They're going to make money out of that. That's going to further increase the, the wage gap. But if we're talking about Artemis and, uh, and, and especially collaborative efforts between nations, then that starts to go back to that unifying model of this is us humanity doing this. And I think we need to, to uh, realign 
the stigma of space research back to that kind of model where people do feel invested that this is something that they are participating in because uh, the the even with the with, with the space tourism and, and Branson um, saying that he's going to have some kind of a lottery so that you know even your your average person could be lucky enough to to get a ticket on, on one of the flights. People aren't really persuaded by that, I don't think, because they know that the chances of that are so small. And, you know, it's like... Yeah, it, people still play the lottery. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, 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 they're, but they're feeling in, invested in that it's something which is benefiting everybody. It's just benefiting a, a very, very tiny handful of people. So uh, I, I think the more that we can focus on the unifying model, the better. And of course, you know, finally, you know, I think one of the most important things here is exactly what you're leading up to, which is the overview effect. You know, as people go up in this space, they see Earth as a whole without national borders, without, you know, petty squabbles and, you know, border disputes. Do you think that there, if a, you know, if space flight or trips to the edge of space become as common as, say, cruise line, you know, going on a cruise. Um, what effect could, you know, the overview effect have on on humanity's perception of our place in the universe? I th so I think that's extremely important. Um, uh, we, we've, we've all seen these famous pictures. There are, there are various of them, uh, of them around. There's the picture of, called Earthrise, which is a, a picture taken from the surface of the moon, of, uh, of the Earth. And, um, uh, and the various quotes of the astronauts uh, about uh, um, all humankind being one. And of course, there's the, there's the famous picture that, that Carl Sagan popularized of the pale blue dot and mm -hmm. the picture looking back on Earth just essentially as a single pixel. Um, but uh, it's, it's hard to really um, get inside the meaning behind those pictures. I think a lot of, like, like many things, I mean, you can talk about uh, being inside the Sistine Chapel, but but unless you actually go there and experience it and the feeling and the and the and the uh, the aura, if you like, of being there, then you don't have that same emotional impact. And so that's uh, consistent with what we always hear about um, uh, uh, astronauts' experiences. And Bezos himself, he he said when he came back down that nothing could have prepared him for seeing the Earth as a as a planet. He said that after he came came back, uh, and. And I think he's right. Uh, so I think when a lot of people uh, go up and they do see <laughs> the, this uh, this view of the Earth and without borders, as you mentioned, I think that's that that's extremely important. I, I, so going going forward, I would help. Oh, I, I would hope that that would be the ultimate unifying experience. Great. Thanks so much for being on the show, Stephen. It was great talking with you. Oh, no problem at all. Anytime. Thanks. And that was Dr. Stephen Kane, planetary astrophysicist at University of California, Riverside. Next week, we welcome Stephanie Ryan to the show. She is the author of Let's Learn Chemistry, and we're going to be talking about teaching science to children. Please make sure to join us then. And visit with us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring the cosmos down to Earth and scientists directly into your homes with fun, informative interviews. Subscribe to our VIP newsletter and see every episode of this show a day early. Now, this show is only possible through the support of viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, and I sure hope you did, check out every episode of the show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. 
Also, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or our free or favorite podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Hmm.